Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. The story begins as a peaceful city is attacked by a monster known as a kaiju. The emergency kaiju alert sounds throughout the city and people are directed to designated safety areas. This thing is huge and it causes massive destruction while roaming the city, so a defense force arrives and opens fire on it. This isn't humanity's first time being attacked, so some people watching the scene eagerly wait to see which division of the defense force will arrive. It's the third division, and they swiftly move in to deal some damage to the kaiju. One girl from the division carries a large cannon and uses this weapon's immense power to put a hole right through the kaiju, ending its life as she watches. Afterwards, our protagonist named Kafka is amazed at how huge the monster was. Its body parts are scattered everywhere, so he tells the others in his group that they will surely have to work overtime for a while. Nearby, citizens cheer the 3rd Division for completing their mission with no casualties. Kafka arrives in awe of the crowd that has gathered, and while the heroes walk away from the defeated monster, Kafka walks towards it. This is because his job begins after the battle is over. Him and the group he is in does the job that no one cares about and no one is grateful for. They are in charge of taking the defeated kaijus apart and getting rid of them. Kafka does just that and deposits a sample of the monster in some drone. Their job is not as glamorous as fighting the beast, but it's definitely a different kind of battle in its own right. This is perfectly demonstrated when Kafka notices someone hoisting something they should not be and it explodes, causing someone to get hurt. Luckily, Kafka has had injuries just like it before, so he handles the situation. These guys have a ton of work ahead of them, and Kafka laments how the bosses want them to clean up the gigantic mess in just one week. Just then, Kafka is told that he will be going to a different area, as they are short-staffed, and he is shocked to hear that he will be going to the intestines. Kafka is dragged away, so the others discuss just how bad the intestines are. Kafka arrives at the intestines, and instantly loses his appetite. He is a hard worker though, so Kafka pushes through his discomfort to get the job done. That night, Kafka arrives home exhausted, and he does his best to get rid of the smell from work. A news report comes on about Division 3 and their captain named Mina. At just 27 years old, she has not just become the captain, she has managed to slay hundreds of kaiju. A look back shows that she and Kafka were friends, and she was emotional when they promised to eliminate kaiju together. Mina is incredibly popular and famous now, so there are talks of her becoming a candidate for commander of the defense force. Kafka wonders how he ended up on the opposite side of things, but the thought is too depressing so he tries not to think about it. He reminds himself that cleaning is also an important job that helps people. On top of that, he's able to eat the foods he likes and has an apartment that he is content with. Kafka thinks that this should be enough and just goes to sleep. The next morning, Kafka arrives at work where he is introduced to the part-time student that will be working with them from now on. His name is Ichikawa, and he is determined to join the defense force. Kafka's co-worker points out that Kafka had the same dream he has, but he eventually just gave up and became a veteran at the cleaning company. Ichikawa wonders why he gave up, so Kafka concedes that he realized that his abilities are limited. He tried hard, but there's always someone better. Kafka tries to have a positive attitude about it, but Ichikawa is completely serious. He declares that he will never give up for any reason, so he can't understand Kafka's logic. He doesn't want to understand either, so he just goes to get changed. Everyone thought that they would get along because of their shared dream, but Kafka is furious since he knows that there was no way to answer the kid's question without looking miserable. Kafka is forced to do some reflection, and he wonders if quitting is really that bad. They all head to work and go over the plan for the day. They decide which parts need to be preserved for research and which parts simply need to be destroyed. Ichikawa is assigned to the intestines. Kafka is glad because of the kid's attitude, but he finds that he will be assigned to intestines as well for the second day in a row. He is told that it's because he's good at dealing with intestines, so Kafka vows to show everyone what he's made of. The boss points out how Kafka complains a lot but acknowledges that he is a diligent worker. If he had passed the exam, he would have been a good defense force officer. Afterwards, Kafka is happy to see that Ichikawa was grossed out by the intestines experience, but he had it just as bad as he must keep himself from puking. Just then, Kafka notices that the kid didn't bring much to eat. Ichikawa rudely tells him that he doesn't have much of an appetite, but Kafka gives him a vitamin drink. He insists that Ichikawa eat and drink as much as he can, or else he won't be able to make it through the workday. 
Kafka also offers him some nose plugs. Ichikawa refuses them, but Kafka insists that it will help. At the end of the workday, everyone gets cleaned off, and one group leaves first. Kafka is glad to see that the worst part of the cleanup process should be over now. Ichikawa arrives, so Kafka thinks he wants a rematch from their little wrestling match, but Ichikawa surprisingly thanks him for his help getting through the day. Before he leaves, Ichikawa points out that the defense force has changed their age limit to join. It is now 33 years old. Ichikawa knows that it's none of his business, but he could tell that Kafka looks sad when he talked about the defense force earlier. Ichikawa tells him that he can just quit if he wants though, but Kafka thanks him and states that Ichikawa is a better person than he thought. Ichikawa tries to keep his edgy persona, so he reminds Kafka that he doesn't actually care, but just then a monster appears to attack him. Kafka rescues him just in time, but he's in bad shape. Ichikawa is shocked by what he calls a yoju, and Kafka must rescue him from being eliminated once again. Kafka tells him to run and get help, but he refuses to leave Kafka. Kafka reminds Ichikawa that he's supposed to join the defense force, but he won't be able to if he dies now. Kafka once again demands that Ichikawa leave, so he does. Kafka gets the terrifying monster to chase him through the streets, and just barely manages to dodge its attacks. He then gets away for a moment by running into a narrow building and runs through a pane of glass. Another look back shows that Kafka and Mina both lost their schools and their homes. Kafka hated the kaiju, but only because they kept him from finishing his Pokemon game. Mina was disappointed to hear that this was all he cared about, but Kafka was just keeping a positive attitude. As for Mina though, she was sad because a cat named Miko died. They became serious as they stared at all the damage done by the kaiju, and they simultaneously declared that they will join the defense force. The two insult each other for this crazy idea since they are both so young, but they eventually decide to have a competition to see who can become the coolest officer. Kafka was sure that they could do it, and declared that they will eliminate all the kaiju together. Back to the present, Kafka realizes that things should not have ended up this way. He must continue running though, as the monster's just smashing through buildings to get to him. Kafka decides to make a stand against the monster, and determines that he must attack its legs. Unfortunately, he doesn't stand a chance, as the monster instantly attacks him, and Kafka wonders why things ended up this way. Kafka screams in agony as the monster stomps on him, and he can no longer move as his leg is broken. Kafka loses all hope as the monster is just about to consume him, but Ichikawa appears to rescue him just in time. Kafka calls him an idiot, but Ichikawa explains that he already notified the defense force. Kafka meant that he was an idiot for coming back at all, but Ichikawa points out that if he abandoned Kafka, he would never be able to become a Defense Force officer. Just then, Kafka has flashbacks to when he received the Defense Force rejection letter, and his dreams were crushed. He curses himself for being so useless, as Ichikawa gets thrashed around by the monster. Kafka is furious since he hasn't changed at all. He wasn't able to protect his friend's cat, and now he can't even protect the new kid at work. Kafka's frustration causes him to scream out with rage, just as Ichikawa is about to be eliminated by the beast. However, just then, the monster is absolutely blown to pieces, leaving the two guys shocked. A female voice declares that the target has been eliminated, and Kafka is shocked to see that Mina has arrived with the other members of the 3rd Division. She has some of her crew take care of the injured, while her and the rest go check for more yoju. Kafka is checked on, but he's in really bad shape and unresponsive. That night at the Yokohama hospital, Kafka marvels at how amazing Mina has become. She was able to eliminate such a terrifying monster in an instant, so Kafka determines that she has gone to a place that he can never reach. Kafka thought that he was alone, but he is shocked when he learns that Ichikawa is right next to him. Ichikawa points out that if Kafka didn't rescue him and tell him to run away, he would be dead right now. Kafka is then shocked when Ichikawa says that he is cool, and Kafka thinks about his competition with Mina to become the coolest officer. Ichikawa thinks that Kafka should be an officer, but once again declares that it's up to him. Kafka punches himself, finally snapping out of his negative mindset, as he wonders how long he was intending to turn a blind eye. He thanks Ichikawa and tells the kid that he really is a good person. Kafka still doesn't think that giving up is a bad thing, but it's definitely not good to deceive himself. He then confidently declares that he will once again aim to become a Defense Force officer. His heroic declaration is interrupted though, when he's shocked to find a monster hovering above him. This thing says that it has found him, and it shoves itself into Kafka's mouth. Ichikawa wonders if he is okay, but he's clearly not as he gasps for air and thrashes about. 
Ichikawa checks on him, but he is shocked to find a monster in Kafka's bed. Kafka casually looks at Ichikawa, and then casually looks at his reflection. The shock eventually hits them, so Kafka tries to tell Ichikawa to calm down, and that it's him. Ichikawa calms down, but some old guy arrives to call the defense force. The guys freak out as they think about what the defense force does to Kaiju, so the guys panic as Ichikawa tells Kafka to run. Another look back shows Kafka telling Mina how to immobilize Kaiju. She took notes as he told her that she needed to attack the legs and tie it up. Mina was scared by the thought of fighting a monster, so Kafka assured her that when the time comes, he will be by her side. Back to the present, Mina thinks about how that was a lie. Just then, Mina is informed that a kaiju was spotted at the Yokohama hospital, and she declares that she will handle it. She will dispatch along with her officers, and they will eliminate the kaiju. Another look back shows that Mina made fun of Kafka for saying that he would be right by her side when she got scared. Kafka was completely embarrassed, so he told her not to tell anyone he said that. Mina was actually really grateful, so she thanked him, and agreed that there's nothing to be afraid of as long as they are together. Back to the present, Mina has assembled her division, and they prepare to head to the hospital to eliminate the kaiju that appeared there. An alarm sounds around the entire city, telling people to take shelter from the kaiju. At the hospital, the guys panic as the old man is terrified of Kafka. Ichigawa thinks they can clear up the misunderstanding if Kafka just smiles, but Kafka's smile is horrifying. It clearly doesn't work as the old man passes out. Kafka rushes to help him, but he shocks himself with his own strength as he destroys the area with the slightest touch. Kafka can't believe that he did all that, and others notice that a kaiju is there. Ichikawa is sure that the defense force is on their way, so they agree to leave. Kafka goes to escape out the window, but once again shocks himself when the slightest touch destroys an entire wall. Kafka wonders what's going on with his body, but there's no time to think as people are beginning to panic. The two guys jump out the window, but Kafka launches himself much farther than he expected. Ichikawa tries to make sense of what's going on, but he begins to wonder if this kaiju is really Kafka. He asks Kafka if he is really him, but Kafka isn't even sure anymore as his body is going out of control. Ichikawa wonders if this transformation is a special mode of his, but Kafka has no clue. Just then, the parasite extends out of his mouth to eat a bird alive. Luckily, Kafka reverts back, but he reveals that there is trouble. Ichikawa wonders what kind of terrifying thing awaits them next, but Kafka just says that he needs to pee. Ichikawa just tells him to hold it, but he can't and Kafka shames himself for being an adult that can't hold it in. Ichigawa points out that Kafka doesn't even seem to have the right parts to pee, and he wonders where it will even come out of. Kafka then shocks them both when he pees out of his nipples. Kafka is even more ashamed now, but Ichikawa reminds him that they have more important things to worry about. Kafka wonders if he can still join the defense force the way he is now, but Ichikawa points out that he is what the defense force eliminates. They probably won't let him join, and instead they will just destroy him. Kafka gets serious as this fact starts to sink in. The timing couldn't be worse either, as he just decided to try and catch up with Mina. They prepare to enter a restricted area where no one will be around, but Kafka senses something approaching. It's not the defense force though, since it's coming from underground. An explosion occurs elsewhere in the city, and the defense force receives a report that another kaiju has appeared. Kafka is able to tell that it's the same type that attacked them before. Ichikawa points out that they already sounded the alarms because of Kafka, so he hopes that there won't be any casualties. This kaiju will keep the defense force busy, so it's the perfect time for them to hide. Elsewhere, a girl sobs as her mother is trapped, and they are found by the kaiju. The mother begs her daughter to run away, but it's too late as the kaiju is about to consume her. However, just then, Kafka arrives to hit the kaiju with an incredibly powerful punch. Kafka shocks himself once again with how powerful he is, and he goes to check on the girl. Of course she is scared of him, so Kafka reminds himself to smile, but this just makes it worse. He rescues the unconscious mother, so Ichikawa explains that she will be fine. The kaiju returns, so Kafka tells him to get out of there. Ichikawa wonders what he's planning to do, so Kafka reveals that he's going to try punching the kaiju as hard as he can. Kafka begins a countdown as his body bursts with power, and he unleashes the powerful punch. This strike absolutely destroys the monster, sending its parts flying everywhere, and its blood rains down from the sky. Kafka still can't believe how insanely strong he is, and Ichikawa is sure that Kafka can never use that punch on a human. 
Kafka tells them that they can safely head to the hospital now, but he's more terrifying than ever. He tells the girl not to worry because the defense horse will be there soon, so he is leaving. The girl stops him though and thanks him. This reminds Kafka of when Mina thanked him, and he imagines a future where he is fighting by Mina's side. Ichikawa wants them to run before they are found, but Kafka declares that he isn't giving up after all. Kafka reveals his human face again, and states that he must go and stand by Mina's side. The defense force arrives soon after to wonder what in the world just happened to the obliterated kaiju. Mina asks the little girl to tell her everything, but she is terrified just thinking about it. Mina tells her not to worry, and promises that she will destroy all the kaiju for her. The girl gets worried for a different reason though, and Mina is shocked when the little girl wants her to promise that she won't hurt the good kaiju. She clarifies by saying it's the one that saved her mom, but Mina can't even comprehend what the little girl just said. Three months later, a news report reveals that the Defense Force has given a code name to the unknown kaiju. They have a drawing of it from witness testimony, and they are calling it Kaiju Number 8. All Kafka's cleaning company co-workers just assume that the kaiju is probably already dead. Ichikawa arrives at work and thinks about how Kafka became the first kaiju in history to escape the defense force. However, this means that every defense force officer in the country is looking for him now. Just then, their boss explains that Kafka and Ichikawa received something in the mail. The other guys discuss how Kafka would take an exam every year and they always had to cheer him up after he got the results. Ichikawa checks his letter and the others congratulate him as he passed the first round of Defense Force selection exams. On his way to give Kafka his letter, Ichikawa can't help himself so he checks Kafka's results. He sees good news so he rushes off excitedly. The other guys can see that this means Kafka finally passed. This will be Kafka's last chance to enter the Defense Force so the guys are happy for him. He is finally getting his opportunity after working so hard for so long. Ichikawa excitedly tells Kafka that he passed the first round of exams, but he becomes furious when Kafka is in his kaiju form. Kafka changes back as he didn't even notice, but he doesn't fully transform. Ichikawa points out that he was just on the news, so he needs to be more careful. We then learn that they returned to the hospital shortly after the whole incident and just lied about everything. Ichikawa thought that Kafka would be more happy about the letter, but Kafka reveals that the second round is where he always fails. Ichikawa wonders if Kafka is really planning to take the next exams with this crazy body of his. Kafka assures him that no one will notice, but he still can't get his transformation right. Ichikawa points out that the first round is just a written test and some paperwork, but there will be officers everywhere during the second. This will be really dangerous as they will eliminate Kafka on sight if they see he is a kaiju, but Kafka declares that he's taking the exam no matter what. He has been working real hard these past three months and this is his last chance since he is 32 years old. Ichikawa is just as determined, so he says that no matter what happens to Kafka, he's not going to drop out either. They agree that if they're going to do it, then they're going to do it as rivals. Kafka casually goes to drink something, but he has a hard time opening his water bottle. He ends up transforming and destroying it with his immense strength, so Ichikawa takes back everything he said. The two finish arguing, and Ichikawa tells them that the other cleaners will arrive soon. Kafka is actually relieved that he passed the first round, and he declares that it's time for his revenge match against the second round of exams. Ten days later, the guys arrive at the Defense Force's Tachikawa base for the exam. Ichikawa has been to a different base on a field trip before, but this one is much bigger. This one shares the area with the self-defense force garrison, so troops are everywhere. Ichikawa points out how it makes things much more dangerous, since if Kafka transforms there, then he would be eliminated within seconds. Other examinees begin arriving, so Kafka declares that it's time to go. He wants to get checked in even though they are pretty early, but some girl gets his attention by calling him an old man. Kafka points out that he is not old since he's still just 32, but she points out that that is old. She tells him to move his truck, but he states that there are tons of other parking spots. She insists though since her lucky number for the day is 5. Kafka has had enough of the annoying girl, so he declares that he will teach her some manners. Kafka is shocked when she removes her dress to reveal her suit underneath, and she declares that she will just move his vehicle herself. The guys are shocked by her suit which seems to give her immense power and she lifts the truck with one hand. 
They are horrified as she just tosses it aside, and Kafka points out that that is a company vehicle. Ichikawa wonders just who the heck she is, so she reveals that she is examinee number 216. Her name is Kikaru, and her hobby is eliminating kaiju. She tells them to remember her name, and Ichikawa is shocked when he recognizes her last name. Kikaru then turns her attention back to Kafka. She gives him a sniff, and points out that he smells just like a kaiju. Ichikawa quickly explains that they are part of the kaiju disposal unit. Kikaru is then shocked when Kafka easily lifts his truck, and she assumes that he must have his own hidden power suit. Kafka introduces himself as examining number 2032, and dramatically tells the kiddo to remember his name. His cool introduction is interrupted though, when he realizes that Kikaru's butler took his parking spot. Kikaru thought the exam would be really boring, but explains that it's getting interesting. She vows to show up Kafka really bad and leaves. Ichikawa is furious with Kafka for already using his powers, but Kafka points out that he was able to only transform the part she couldn't see. They tell some guards that the loud noise was nothing, but Ichikawa tells Kafka that he will send him home if he pulls any more stunts. Kafka knows that this is his last chance to stand by Mina, so he promises himself that he won't give up this time. Moments later though, Kafka struggles really bad during the exam. He has been keeping up with his training, and he does really hard physical work every day, but he just can't keep up right now. A look back to a moment ago shows Ichikawa explaining that the second stage of the exam has two parts, a fitness test and an aptitude test. They can't change their aptitude, which means they have to get the best grades they can in the fitness test. However, Kafka's having a really hard time. He was always pretty below average, but things have gotten way worse. He is really falling behind, so he wonders if people really become this weak after turning 30. Falling behind makes Kafka think about transforming, but that would just be crazy. Unfortunately, Kafka does really poorly, and receives a rank of 219 out of 225. Kikaru reveals that she ranked 5th, and mocks Kafka as it didn't take long at all to show him up. Kafka thinks about how he dramatically told her to remember his name, but he wants her to forget his name now. Ichikawa is just glad that Kafka didn't use his powers, and Kafka explains that it wouldn't be fair if he did, since everyone worked so hard to get there. Kafka just said that to sound cool though, and he wishes that he did use his powers. Kafka is sure that he would have done better, but Ichikawa thinks that there was another reason why Kafka received the rank he did. Elsewhere, Mina is shown this year's applicants. Her subordinate assumes that she won't care because all she cares about is eliminating kaiju, but he is shocked when she's willing to hear more while she works. The guy explains that a guy named Nozumo has his attention. He graduated at the top of his class, and he's the most promising of this year's group. Ichikawa notices Sky as well, as he just ranked second. The guy who ranked third is Iharu, the valedictorian of some big university. The guy who ranked first though is Kaguragi, the rising star of the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. Those guys aren't the only ones, as most examinees this year are from top universities. Normally, people like them would be trying to become elite officers, not field agents. This is probably why Kafka ranks so low, and Kafka realizes that this is why they seem so strong. Ichikawa explains that even among all these strong guys, there is one person everyone is watching. She graduated from California Neutralization at age 16. She skipped grades and became the youngest ever to do so. It's Kikaru and they call her the greatest talent ever. The three top guys are watching her and hope they can measure up. Ichikawa points out that it's a group of extremely skilled applicants, none more so than Kikaru. Kafka tells her that he had no idea that she was so amazing, but he gets beaten by her bodyguards for touching her. Everyone watches and they just assume that Kafka is one of her groupies. Kikaru laughs as she showed him up yet again, but Kafka declares that he will show her up too. In reality though, Kafka knows that things aren't going well, but Ichikawa still has hope. For the last two years, the second part of the test has been Kaiju Corpse Disposal. They want to test examinees' knowledge of Kaiju and their ability to work in a group. They also want to show them that there is more to the job than just eliminating Kaiju. This being in the test is why Ichikawa chose to work part-time at the disposal unit. Kafka's hope is restored, so they decide to bet everything on the next part of the exam. They arrive at the second training area, and 3rd Division Vice Captain named Hoshina introduces himself. He explains that he will be in charge of giving them their aptitude test. 
In this test, they will have to find kaiju. Kafka becomes excited as he thinks that they will have to find them to simply dispose of their bodies, just like Ichikawa said, but he is shocked when Hoshina actually says that they will have to find and neutralize the kaiju. Kafka is then startled when one of these immensely powerful kaiju tries to attack Hoshina, but some security measures stop it. Kafka is still shocked, but all the top guys are clearly eager for this part of the exam. Kikaru laughs at our boy, so Kafka wonders what happened to just disposing of the bodies. Ichikawa explains that that is just what happened the past two years, and he's disappointed too. Hoshina explains that this part of the exam is very dangerous, so they will have them do it while wearing Izumo Tech gear. Ichikawa tries it on, and is amazed as it analyzes his body measurements and adjusts its shape specifically for him. The suit becomes one with his body, and Ichikawa can even feel his muscles getting stronger. These are Demon Defense Force combat suits, and it's made from organic material taken from kaiju. It massively multiplies the combat power of its wearer. Elsewhere, Konami, the 3rd Division operator, states that she will start measuring the unleashed combat power of the ones wearing their suits. Ichikawa's combat power is 8%. Izumu is at 18%, Kagaragi is at 15%, and Ihiro is at 14%. Unleashed combat power indicates how much of the suit's power an examinee was able to draw out. Even after tons of training, it's usually around 20%, and they are lucky if they even get just one applicant a year above 10%. These three guys are all over 10%, so Hoshina wonders if this year will be something they have never seen before. Just then, everyone is absolutely shocked as Konami sees that Kikuro's unleashed combat power is at 46%. Everyone is in awe of her, and Hoshina thinks about how she's already at the level of a platoon leader. She hasn't even joined the force yet, so they assume that this must be some kind of record. Ichikawa is down on himself for only being at 8%, but Hoshina explains that that's still pretty good for the first time. As long as examinees don't have a zero, they will pass, and Hoshina explains that he has never even seen a zero before. There's a first time for everything as everyone is shocked once again, but this time it's because Kafka is revealed to have an unleashed combat power of 0%. Everyone laughs at him and Konami even wonders if there was some kind of error. Kafka tells them to just give him some more time as he's trying to squeeze out the combat power. Hoshina laughs uncontrollably though, as he points out that this isn't like using the bathroom, and he can't just squeeze it out. Hoshina is really starting to like Kafka, but he assumes that he won't be able to pass the exam. Kafka figures that there might be some kind of trick to getting a higher percentage, and tries hard to figure it out before the exam ends. Kikaru is getting really frustrated with him, and she just wishes that he would show the power he used in the parking lot. Hoshina then enters the room and reveals that it's time to start the final part of the exam. He explains that their targets will be 1 Hanju and 36 Yoju, and they have been placed throughout an urban training area. These kaiju caused 16 casualties in total, and they were captured alive to serve as training aids. Examinees will fight them with anti-kaiju weapons, and drones will monitor their actions. If they sense that an examinee is in danger, they will activate the shield in their suits to save them, but this will also mean that they fail the exam. The exam is extremely dangerous, so Hoshina can't guarantee that they will even survive. They will have to choose if they want to take part, so Hoshina begins the test. The examinees eagerly rush forward, but they are stunned when Kikuro jumps ahead. She quickly and easily takes down two Yoju, amazing everyone. Kafka declares that they need to push ahead so they don't fall behind, but Ichikawa points out that Kafka is the one holding them back. Kafka defends himself by pointing out that the weapons are very heavy without the help of the suit. He tries to make it sound cool by saying that only he, the Zero, can understand this, but Ichikawa doesn't think it's cool at all. Things are not looking good as Ichikawa points out that they don't have the offensive power that the others have. Just then, Hoshina reveals that Mina has arrived to watch the exam. Kafka remembers their challenge to see who could become the cooler Defense Force officer, and he calms himself down. He stops caring about being a zero, and reminds himself that this is his last chance. Kafka realizes something, and asks Ichikawa why they are being watched by drones. If they just wanted to keep track of how many kaiju examinees eliminated, they could easily do that with sensors. This isn't the case because aside from testing their abilities, what they are also testing is how well they can adapt to the situation. 
The two of them realize that since they lack the same kind of offensive capability, what they should really be doing is supporting all the attackers the best they can. They find a nearby fight going on, so they get in position to help. Kafka notices the hooves of this Yoju and recognizes it from one of his cleanups. His experience pays off as he remembers that stun grenades are incredibly effective against this Yoju. It has weak eyesight but incredibly good hearing. Once they are deafened, they are easy targets. His expertise doesn't end there as he tells Uzumo to aim for its stomach because that's its weak spot. The attackers do just that and they are surprised when they're able to defeat the beast. They thank Kafka for the great support, but Kafka's upset because he called him Kikaru's groupie. In the observation room, they actually take notice of what Kafka and Ichikawa are doing. Kafka points out to Ichikawa that they have taken apart more kaiju bodies than they can count. He becomes confident that they can use this knowledge now, and Kafka's relieved that he doesn't need his kaiju power. He's finally excited that he will be able to make up for all his screw-ups. However, all this optimism ends abruptly when a kaiju appears out of nowhere. This thing sends Kafka flying into a building, and Konami detects that he is severely injured. He won't be able to continue battle, and the Yoju is approaching him, so they prepare his suit shield. Kafka realizes that they will probably use the shield, but he knows that this will mean he fails the exam. He knows that Mina is watching, so Kafka tries to force himself up. He refuses to embarrass himself in front of her anymore, but this beast is about to eat him. Konami begins the activation of the remote shield, and Hoshina thinks about how he knew that Kafka would be the first to drop out. He thinks it's a real shame, because Kafka was a pretty funny guy. However, just then, the Yoju gets blown to bits, and Kikuru points out that this is the third time she has shown up Kafka. She declares that while she is on the battlefield, nobody gets to quit. Kafka is amazed by her, but she interrupts him. She declares that she will go on to defeat even more kaiju, so he can just lie on the ground like a loser. The other guys can tell that she's going for the main target, but they refuse to just let her take it from them. Kikuru then easily takes out another Yoju. Ihiru thinks she is just way too powerful, and he wonders if she really has on the same suit they do. Kafka wants to go after the main target as well, but his leg is broken and he can't even stand up. Hoshina explains that Kafka has multiple fractures and possibly even organ damage. Kafka wonders if this means that he will have to give up, but he refuses to let himself think that way. Kafka thinks about how horrible it felt to see that he had 0% combat power and to think that this meant he could never stand by Mina's side. He becomes frustrated when he thinks about how only those with talent pass. Hoshina recommends that Kafka just drop out and explains that the suit shields aren't foolproof. Kafka has become defiant though and thinks about how he is the one who decides if he gives up or not. He declares that even though he is too old for dreams and even if he looks like an idiot, he has decided to bet his entire life up to this point and chase his dreams again. As Kafka makes this declaration, everyone in the observation room is shocked to see that his combat power has gone up 0.01%. Kafka declares that this time he's not giving up no matter what, and Mina takes notice. Kafka proudly shows that he can still stand, which amazes Konami because his leg is broken. Hoshina decides to let him have his way, but warns that he will activate the shield if things look bad. Kafka tells Ichikawa to go ahead without him, since that is the deal they had, but Ichikawa decides to back him up instead. Kafka realizes that this is just the kind of guy Ichikawa is, so he accepts his help. Hoshina has a good laugh at them though, as Ichikawa carries Kafka. Ichikawa admits that he's really embarrassed, but the two of them are really determined. Kafka's broken bones are hurting him a lot, so Ichikawa will act as their legs, and Kafka will use all his knowledge to handle the attacking. Hoshina just wants to pass the two of them already, because they provide amazing comedy relief. Kafka instructs Ichikawa to follow Kikaru, and he is amazed by his friend's speed. Kikaru is busy forcing everyone to eat her dust while she defeats a bunch of kaiju, so Ichikawa tells Kafka to be ready to support her when they catch up to her. All the guys watch as Kikaru does her thing, and they are disappointed that she won't even let them help. Konami announces that Kikaru has eliminated the last yoju in the area, and is already engaging the hanju. Kikaru uses a grenade to get the beast all riled up, and she uses this moment to get in the perfect position to annihilate it. Kikaru calmly says that this is the last one as she slowly pulls the trigger and this makes Hoshina smirk as she fires into the monster. 
Konami is stunned as she announces that the Hanju is defeated and the final stage of the exam is complete. Our boys are of course shocked as they didn't get to help and Kafka declares that Kikuru is just too fast. Konami now just needs to bring back the drones and send medics for the injured. Hoshina is surprised that the exam ended so quickly even though it took so much time to set up. Mina is impressed that Kikuru is even more powerful than they say and Hoshina is shocked that Kikuru was even powerful enough to catch Mina's eye. It was expected that at least 30 people would drop out but none did and Hoshina is sure that it was because of Kikuru. This performance is to be expected though of director Shinomiya's daughter. Hoshina is sure that she will be a big shot in the defense force and a ray of hope for the entire country. Back at the exam, Kikuru just hopes that she was able to make her father proud by being perfect on the battlefield. Kikuru relaxes as she decides to go laugh at Kafka some more, but a strange being shockingly appears behind her and instantly causes massive damage. Just then, everyone is horrified as all the fallen kaiju start moving again. Kikuru was just barely able to protect her heart by focusing her entire shield on a single point, but she decides that she can still fight. She is stunned when the mysterious monster is able to talk and it wonders how she can still move. Kikuru determines that it's a kaiju, but she is shocked to see that it's intelligent. Kikuru decides to attack it, but this monster instantly strikes her several times. Kikuru screams in agony and Konami is shocked to see her vitals drop. They have no clue what's going on, but they are detecting live signals from the kaiju that were already eliminated. What's most shocking though is that the estimated fortitude of the revived Hanju is a 6.4. This is much more powerful than before and Hoshina thinks about how an entire company is needed to take down a kaiju of that level. There are not many people capable of taking that thing down fast. Just then Mina tells Konami to activate all remote shields for the examinees and send back some of the drones. Hoshina thinks about how luckily the two of them are some of the people capable enough to defeat this Hanju so they head out. Examinees are instructed to evacuate, but Kikuru refuses. She thinks that a lot of people will lose their lives if she doesn't stop this thing herself. She uses the suit to stop the bleeding and determines that she can still fight. Just then, Kikuru thinks of her father's words when he told her to be perfect for their nation. Kikuru now demands perfection from herself, but she is easily knocked to the side by the Hanju. She can barely even move now, but she still refuses to lose. A look into the past shows that Kikuru was proud to receive the top grade in class. All the students around her of course didn't do as well, but their parents were at least there to celebrate with them. Kikuru tried to stay positive though as her butler assured her that her father would be home that day and he would surely be pleased with her score. However, in reality, her father didn't care about her top score. He declared that rejoicing over a single success would only lead to failure next time. Instead of celebrating, he just wanted her to prepare for her next goal. This is when he told her that she needed to always be perfect for the sake of their nation's future and for the sake of her late mother as well. Her father's words still weigh on her till this day, so she fights back. He always told her to never stop moving forward and to never let anyone be better than her. So now she refuses to lose. Even with just one arm, as long as she can move she will fight. Unfortunately for her, she has just suffered too much damage and she must once again scream from the unbearable pain. Just then, one of the drones spots the Hanju and Konami is shocked to see that its severed offensive uni organ has regenerated. Hoshina gets really worried as Konami determines that it's gathering energy for an attack. Hoshina and Mina are rushing to the site, but he is unsure if they will make it in time. The beast prepares this immense attack and Kikuru comes to the conclusion that she is done for. She apologizes to her father for not being perfect and begins to cry. The Hanju prepares to release its attack, but Kikuru is shocked when Kafka appears to tell her that she did a great job. Kikuru is absolutely stunned as she can't understand why he's there and the monster's attack strikes them. Of course, Kikuru is even more stunned when they are not harmed and Kafka begins to transform. Kafka explains that she did a good job buying time for everyone to evacuate so she can just leave the rest to him. Elsewhere, everyone evacuates frantically. Kaguragi uses flares though to organize the evacuation, which impresses Nozumo. A look back to just moments ago shows that Kafka and Ichikawa were told to evacuate. They were instructed not to go back as Kikuru was fighting the revived Hanju. Ichikawa was ready to evacuate, but Kafka had already disappeared. Ichikawa hoped that Kafka wasn't crazy enough to transform since he was sure that he would be eliminated on the spot if he did. 
As Ichikawa rushes to the site, he realizes that Kafka definitely is crazy enough to transform, since he doesn't hesitate in these kinds of situations. Back with Kikuru, she's absolutely stunned by Kafka's transformation, and she can't understand how he could be a kaiju. Kafka shows that he's just his normal self, as he begs her not to tell the defense force. Just then, Kikuru is terrified, as the Hanju uses its immensely powerful attack again, but Kafka easily deflects it. Kafka promises to tell her everything in a moment, as he only needs one second to eliminate the beast. Just then, Konami detects a mysterious ultra-powerful energy source near the Hanju. The explosion knocked out their comms, so they have no visual. They do have a reading on its fortitude, but Konami refuses to believe that it's real. This mysterious beast supposedly has a fortitude of 9.8. Hoshina says that's impossible, and just assumes that the explosion must have scrambled the measurement system. It's impossible because if it were true, then this would be one of the most powerful kaiju in history. Kafka powers up like the insanely powerful beast he is. He apologizes to the Hanju as he is simply running out of time, and he must end things with one punch. Kikuru then watches in utter amazement as Kafka's punch meets the Hanju's punch, and the Hanju is blown to bits. Kikuru's shock is written all over her face, and the Hanju's body parts get scattered everywhere. Kafka is pleased with his work, and tells the monster to try to come back to life after his attack. The thing starts moving again though, so Kafka begs it to stop, as he was just joking. The monster really is defeated though, and Kikuru can only wonder just who this guy is. Kafka saves her from another attacking Yoju, and reveals his face. He assures her that she is safe now, but scolds her for putting herself in so much danger. Soon enough, Kafka is the one being scolded as Ichikawa arrives. Kafka explains that he was only planning to transform part of his body, but he had to change the plan when he saw the Hanju. Ichikawa still scolds him, but the argument ends when Kikuru passes out. Soon after, Mina and Hoshina arrive at the scene, but they can't imagine what could have caused this much damage to the Hanju. Just then, Konami reports that Kikuru, Ichikawa, and Kafka have made it out, which means that the evacuation is complete. Hoshina admits that Kikuru is incredibly strong, but there is no way she could have obliterated the Hanju like this. Mina points out that between the Kaiju coming back to life and this blast area, there's a lot they don't understand. Mina then issues an order for an investigation unit to inspect the area, while she and Hoshina wipe out the remaining Yoju. Hoshina realizes that this blast is similar to what they saw three months ago, and he wonders if they are connected. Later, we see that Kafka is back in another hospital. Ichikawa explains that Kikuru is recovering as well, as they are using the Defense Force's best technology to treat her. Kafka reflects on the exam, which reminded him how difficult it is to compete against incredible people. It also reminded him that chasing your dreams means there's always someone out there who's beating you at the things you care about the most. Most importantly though, he remembered that you get so excited that you don't even care. Kafka is glad that he decided to take the exam again, and he thanks Ichikawa for encouraging him. Just then, Mina surprisingly appears, and simply thanks them for carrying Kikuru to the shelter. She leaves just as fast as she appeared, so Kafka almost calls out to her. He stops himself though as it's not the right time, and he would rather wait to talk to her after he becomes an officer. He's more confident than ever that this will happen, and he makes a silent promise in his mind, telling her to just watch. Nearby, Kikuro has a nightmare about failing to be perfect for her father. She wakes up to wonder if her father has arrived, but it's just Hoshina. He explains that there were no casualties, and it was all thanks to her defeating the Hanju. Her shock from hearing this makes him wonder if she was not the one that defeated it. Kikuro remembers what Kafka said, so she declares that she was the one that eliminated the Hanju. That night, a news report explains what happened at the exam, and reveals that while many were injured, there were no fatalities. In some bathroom stall, we see that the mysterious and intelligent kaiju is listening. He's stunned and disappointed to hear that there were no fatalities at all. Just then, the phone rings and the monster reminds himself about how to answer it. When he does, the voice on the other end tells him that he needs to get back to work. This monster transforms and puts his uniform on, and we shockingly see that he's a new member of Kafka's disposal unit. Everyone hopes that Kafka and Ichikawa are okay after the exam incident, and the new guy ominously hides his transformation. At the hospital, Ichikawa states that Kafka is starting to look like a man that everyone can depend on. However, when they go back to work, he takes it all back. Kafka is terrified, and he blames Ichikawa for encouraging him to take the exam again. 
Ijikawa points out that he was just thanking him for that at the hospital, and their argument is interrupted when they receive letters. The guys prepare to open them, and agree to do so on the count of three. After thinking about catching up to Mina, Kafka is shocked by his exam results. Later we see that the students that passed the exam have gathered at the Defense Force base. The guys notice that Kikaru's groupie isn't there, but they aren't surprised by any of the results. The room goes silent as Kikuro enters the room, and we learn that she received the top score. Nezumo thought that he would rank first before the exam, but he guesses that they will just have to fight for second place now. Kagaragi doesn't think this way at all though, as he points out that he scored the highest on the fitness exam. He will let Nezumo aim for number 2, as he still plans to aim for number 1. Ihiro introduces himself to Ichikawa, and wonders where the old guy is. He assumes that Kafka didn't pass, and Ichikawa just gets a worried look on his face. Just then, Mina arrives to begin the introduction ceremony, and Kikuro is chosen to speak on behalf of the incoming class. The 27 of them are now considered officers of the Defense Force, and Kikuro declares that they will lay down their lives for the cause. Kikuro is then shocked when Mina thanks her personally for saving everyone at the exam. Kikuru becomes really sad as she knows that Kafka is the one that should be hearing these words and she wonders why he isn't there. He had the audacity to not only save her life, but to also worry about her like she was a little girl. She becomes enraged as it was completely humiliating and she still wants answers to why he was able to become a kaiju. Just then everyone is shocked as Kafka arrives late to the ceremony. It turns out that Kafka actually failed the exam. He scored the lowest on the fitness exam, and received a zero on his aptitude test. During a meeting over who would pass, Mina was about to say something about Kafka, but Hoshina interrupts and declares that he will take Kafka. Kafka's numbers say that he doesn't have what it takes to be an officer, but what he showed on the battlefield says otherwise. Kafka was able to locate the enemy's weak points, and he prioritized helping others over his own kill count. Most importantly though, Kafka really made him laugh. Hoshina isn't sure if Kafka will ever become a full officer, but he will bring him into his platoon as a cadet so he can receive more training. Mina now explains that he's enrolling as a cadet, so she had him skip the introduction ceremony. Kikuru is glad to hear it, and the top guys are too. Mina then gives a speech about how the kaiju are getting stronger, and she won't be able to guarantee the survival of the new officers. However, she vows to stand at the very front so she can act as both their shield and spear. Kafka gets really caught up in her speech, and loudly declares that he will be standing next to her soon. Everyone is shocked as they call him crazy, for calling the captain by her first name. For speaking out of turn, Mina tells him that he owes her 100 push-ups, but he thinks about how it was an accident. Hoshina laughs uncontrollably, and points out that Kafka is already back at his funny ways. Mina leaves, but Hoshina wonders if he just saw her smile a little bit. Konami can't believe that Kafka's already bringing the comedy, but Hoshina explains that this place can get pretty gloomy, and they need a guy like him. However, Hoshina secretly has another reason for keeping Kafka around. He noticed something strange when they detected the 9.8 fortified kaiju. Hoshina still believes that it was just a busted sensor, but what he noticed is that someone's vitals stopped coming in at the same time. This person was Kafka, so Hoshina thinks that there's something strange about him. He has decided to keep Kafka close, so he can find out what that something is. Down below, everyone cheers on the old dude, as he completes the 100 push-ups. Kikuru wants to speak with him, so the guys assume that she wants to confess her love. She denies that, so Kafka assumes that it's one of those meet me after school behind the gym kind of things. Kikuru denies that as well, and just tells him to come with her. He does, and Kikuru is shocked when Kafka reveals that a kaiju forced itself into his mouth. Kafka wonders if he can just tell the Defense Force the truth, as they might be able to cure him. Kikuru is sure that it's a terrible idea, since if they don't eliminate him on the spot, they will surely make him spend the rest of his life being tested and having experiments done on him. Even worse, she has heard a rumor about what they do with kaijus, powerful enough to get a number. After they are defeated, their body parts are used for a special weapon. Kikuru fears that this will happen to Kafka, so he begs her to keep his secret. She agrees to do so, but if he ever tries to harm humanity, she vows to end his life. Everyone gets very serious, but Kafka's actually counting on her to do that if things go bad. Later, everyone watches as Ichikawa performs a training exercise. He completes it in just over 2 minutes and a half, and it is announced that his estimated unleashed combat power was 18%. 
Everyone gasps in amazement, and Hoshina is impressed by how much he has grown in such a short period of time. Ihiro can't believe that Ichikawa just set another personal best score, so he jumps into the exercise next. He goes real hard as he refuses to be outdone. Ihiro finishes in 2 minutes and 15 seconds with an unleashed combat power at 20%. Ihiro is really pleased with himself and he tells Ichikawa to not get too cocky. Just then everyone is absolutely stunned as Kikuro finishes in 1 minute and 15 seconds with an unleashed combat power at 55%. Kikuro taunts the boys as both their scores combined are still worse than hers and Nizumo can't help but feel average around her. Kagaragi points out that he doesn't have time to worry about those better than him as he now has the same combat power as him. Nezumo promises that he will set a new best when it's his turn and all the powerful rivals stare at each other with great intensity. However, the intense moment is broken up when an exhausted Kafka finishes the exercise in 6 whole minutes and has a combat power of 1%. Kafka is actually really happy about this as he has turned the 0% from before into a 1%. Kafka demands that Kikuro praise him, but Hoshina points out that he will never become a full officer at this rate. In fact, he will probably be fired in just 3 months. Hoshina has them all run 10 laps and gives them an extra 5 for complaining about it. Konami can tell that there are a lot of rivals in this class and Hoshina is glad that they're all pushing each other to become better. Afterwards, the guys are all exhausted and Ihiro tries to argue with Ichikawa about who has bigger muscles. Kafka tells the kids to stop arguing and shows them the muscles of a hardworking grown up. Kafka can't hold his stomach in for long though, and Ihiro points out that he can't join the defense force with a spare tire like that one. Kafka tells them all that it will happen to them too after they turn 28 and demands that they arm wrestle him to see who is stronger. Just then, they're all put to shame when Kagaragi enters the room with his bulging muscles. In the laundry room, the girls in the class are shocked to find Mina. Kikuro admires how in shape she is, but she knows that that alone doesn't explain her amazing combat power. Kikuro would like to know what kind of training she has done, so Mina instructs her to stand next to her. Kikuro is shocked that Mina wants to show her right now, but she eagerly agrees to do it. Back at the bath, the guys discuss why they decided to join the defense force. Ihiro was saved by Captain Mina Ashiro, so he always wanted to be a hero like her. All the other guys share the same desire to become heroes because of her. Kafka is amazed about her inspiring so many people, and Ichikawa points out that she is their generation's superhero. They all want to know Kafka's reason, and they are shocked to learn that he was childhood friends with Mina. They are even more stunned to hear that they made a childhood promise, so Kafka tries to sneak away. The guys stop him though, and demand to hear the rest of his story. After the girls bath, Kikuru wonders if something happened to the guys as they don't look too good. It turns out that they were so caught up in conversation that they stayed in the bath too long. They were talking about Mina, so Kikuru just calls them stupid boys. The class would then go on to do even more training exercises. There were a lot of times of tension, but it's pretty clear that they were forming a bond together. They were doing practically everything together and growing stronger as a team. Kafka would one day fall behind during a run, but his buddy Ichikawa was there to help him keep going. One night, Kafka refuses to sleep as he knows that he must work twice as hard as everyone else. Hoshina surprises him and points out that sleep is pretty important too. Kafka refuses to let himself get tired and Hoshina wonders if he's doing it all for Mina. Kafka can't believe that he knows about that, so Hoshina tells him that he should assume that every word he says in the dorm is being recorded. Kafka declares that he made a promise to fight by her side, but Hoshina points out that that could be interpreted as Kafka trying to steal his spot as Mina's vice captain. Kafka hesitates for a moment, but confidently declares that that is what he intends to do, and he will do his best to make it happen. Hoshina seems annoyed, but he allows Kafka to have two more hours for studying. Before he leaves though, Hoshina declares that he will not let Kafka have his spot next to Mina. Kafka thanks him anyway, but Hoshina warns him not to get too close to the other officers. This is because anything could happen at any time. Just then an alarm sounds and everyone wakes up. This is exactly what Hoshina was warning him about and he tells Kafka to get ready for his first mission. Konami gives Mina a status report and informs her that the surrounding area is being evacuated. It is quite the ordeal as tons of people wait to board some buses. The defense force is working with another group that is currently constructing a command post nearby. 
As for the Hanju that appeared, it came from underground and has grown even larger. The appearance of the Hanju has been followed by the appearance of a large number of Yoju. Mina declares that she will handle the Hanju herself, and she picks a spot to snipe from. Mina wishes luck to everyone, and they head out. Hoshina declares that it's time to hunt some kaiju, and Ichikawa tries to wrap his mind around how this is their first mission. Kikuru stares at Kafka in disbelief about him being kaiju number 8. She very seriously hopes that he doesn't disappoint her, but of course he does as he's almost about to throw up. Elsewhere we get a terrifying look at the gigantic Hanju and the evacuation shelter. Kafka and the other members of the Hoshina platoon stand at the neutralization area and Kafka gets his first look at the giant monster. Hoshina explains that Mina's unit will be handling that Hanju, but the problem is that it's creating a ton of Yoju. Their job will be to make sure that the Yoju don't escape from the neutralization area. They are new recruits so it's natural that they are placed at the very rear of the fight, but this also means that they are the last line of defense. No one has any questions as they are all focused on the mission, so Hoshina gets ready to start it. He declares that no matter how good their scores are during training, that won't save a single life. It is now time for them to show what they can do on a real battlefield. All the guys show their camaraderie as they get hyped up and Hoshina tells them to have fun out there. Civilian evacuation is complete and Mina is 8 minutes away from her position. Kafka communicates with Ichikawa and declares that during this mission, he must prove that he can do the job. He thinks about how Hoshina told him that he wouldn't last 3 months the way he's going now and Kafka fears that he might not get another chance to prove himself. Kafka's really nervous but for some reason, he's also really excited. He doesn't know why, but Ichikawa thinks about how this is the job that Kafka always wanted. They both promise to make their first mission a success, and they are told that the first Yoju have arrived in their area. Everyone is ready, so they all heroically jump off the roof of the building. Kafka confidently declares that this mission will be a success, but he's the only one to climb down the side of the building slowly. Elsewhere, Mina arrives at her sniper point. Another group is instructed to lure the Hanju to another area, so they open fire on it. After several attacks, the giant thing begins to move, and Hoshina excitedly waits to see everyone prove themselves. The fight has begun and Kafka is surprised, since it's nothing like the exam, because he's really calm for some reason. Kafka now feels like his suit is actually helping him, and he confidently unleashes his combat power. Unfortunately though, he just gets wrecked by a Yoju. His combat power is still just 1%, so Kikuru tells him that he's too far up front and he should be at the rear. Some veterans are annoyed that they have to fight with the rookies, and they wish that they would just get out of their way and hide somewhere. The veterans then decide to be cautious and wait for the front lines to figure out what the Yoju's weak spots are, but they are shocked when Kikuru already starts taking out the monsters. She refuses to just sit around and wait, so instead she attacks anything that looks like it might be a weak spot. Kikuru takes out a bunch of Yoju, shocking the veterans, as this is not the kind of power that is usually seen from rookies. Kikuru blushes when Kafka tells her that she did a good job, but she gets annoyed when her suit detects an increase in her heart rate. Nearby, the rest of the group works together to take down a Yoju, but Ihiru is shocked when he sees that Ichikawa just took down a Yoju all by himself. Ichikawa explains that he switched out the burst rounds in his rifle for freeze rounds, so he could slow the Yoju down while he fights. This is a better fit for his style, and Ichikawa is confident that if he can get a hang of it, he will be even better at hunting kaiju. This isn't enough for him though, as Ichikawa thinks about how he needs to keep getting stronger, so Kafka won't ever have to transform again. The other top members of the group show just how skilled they are as well, as they eliminate several yoju. The other platoons can't believe how strong the new recruits are, and not even the platoon leaders knew about it. Kagaragi and Nezumo compete to see who can eliminate more kaiju, and one of the platoon leaders activates cougar mode as she drools over them. Hoshina informed her that the average unleashed combat power of the new recruits is higher than in most years. There are a few standouts at the top, and they are motivating the others to do better. Reports of Yoju being eliminated keep rolling in, and Kafka is shocked to hear that even Ichikawa and Ihiru are advancing forward. Kafka gets discouraged when he feels like he's holding everyone back when they're working so hard and he wonders if there's anything he can do. Just then, Kafka remembers that the veterans wanted to wait till they found out what the Yoju's weak points are. Kafka takes a look at one of the Yoju's corpses and decides that he will fight in his own way. 
Just then, some of the others are shocked when they see Kafka messing with the corpse. Kafka is knee deep in this thing, and he realizes that even at just 1%, the suit makes it easy to dismantle a kaiju's body. It's so useful that he hopes that they could give some suits to the cleaning industry. Kafka recognizes the structure of the kaiju, but the core isn't where it normally is in a fungal type monster. Kafka looks around for it, and he is shocked when he finds it. He informs Hoshina that the Yoju's core is at the base of the neck, and Kafka even tells him the best way to attack it for those with weaker attack power. Most importantly though, Kafka has discovered that these Yoju have reproductive organs. It's the white bumpy things on the rear, and if they don't destroy them, then the corpses might spawn new kaiju. Hoshina is amazed by Kafka's work, and he tells Konami to spread the news. Hoshina commends Kafka once again, and Kafka is stunned about actually being able to help the defense force. Kafka rushes off to neutralize the bodies of the defeated kaiju, and he vows to do whatever it takes to stand by Mina's side. Just then, he stops as a large explosion occurs, and Hoshina explains that the main attack on the Hanju has started. The Hanju has been lured to the destination, and the other platoons use suppressing fire to keep it in place. Mina then breaks out her giant weapon and makes the preparations to fire it. With everyone at a safe distance, Mina is given the clear to fire. Mina thinks about her competition with Kafka about becoming the cooler officer, and she prepares to show him how far she has gotten. The insane amount of power she unleashes causes her to destroy the ground beneath her feet, and her suit announces that Mina's unleashed combat power is at an incredible 96%. Hoshina watches her and hopes that Kafka is watching closely as well. Mina fires her weapon and the insanely powerful attack absolutely destroys the gigantic Hanju. Hoshina wanted Kafka to watch so he could see the power of the person he's trying to stand beside. The Hanju's core is now exposed so Mina loads another round into her weapon. She fires away destroying even more of the Hanju and Konami announces that its vitals have disappeared. The thing collapses, and Konami is a bit surprised when Mina loads a third round. Mina fires away again, and Konami announces that the Hanju has stopped moving completely. Everyone is amazed, but they're all shocked when Mina loads a fourth round into her weapon. Konami points out that the Hanju is already down, but Mina just demands that Konami give her the order to fire again. She does, so Mina once again shoots at the monster. Kafka watches in total admiration of her, and Hoshina arrives to wonder if Kafka is ready to give up on his goal. Standing by Mina's side means that he would have to match her incredible strength. Hoshina admits that not even he could do that. His combat power is not as good as hers when it comes to long range weapons, so he can't take down the big boys like she can. The story is completely different however, when it comes to small and mid sized kaiju. Just then, Kafka gets worried when a kaiju appears behind Hoshina, but this just proves to be an opportunity for Hoshina to display the power he spoke of. With just the slightest movement, Hoshina slices the Yoju to pieces, and he declares that he thinks he's better than Mina when it comes to monsters of this size. Kafka couldn't see his attack at all, and Hoshina explains that his family has been a clan of kaiju hunters for generations. He goes on to say that a captain and vice captain are the force's most powerful members. That is why they are given special equipment tailored to their fighting styles. Mina informs Hoshina that the Hanju is down, so Hoshina tells Kafka that it's finally time for the real show to start. Kafka is confused since the Hanju is down already, so Hoshina reminds him that the real problem is the countless yoju that still live inside its corpse. The unbelievable amount of yoju begins swarming out, so Hoshina tells everyone that once they finish off the riffraff, they will be able to go home. The recruits think he's being a little too casual, so the veterans taunt them for giving up already. They are determined to show the new recruits that there's more to fighting than just combat power, so they head out to fight. The cougar named Nakonashima tells Kagaragi and Nozumo that they can just let the veterans take care of everything, but they rather fight. Konami analyzes the new recruits though, and sees that they are tired. Their unleashed combat power and endurance are both falling. Hoshina points out that it's a big mission, but if they can get through it, then it will push them to the next level. Most officers end their career with a combat power between 20 and 30%. However, a very small number of them overcome that wall and become captains. Kikuru is the only new recruit that has reached that level, but Hoshina thinks that there might be another one. This other person is Ichikawa. We then watch as Ichikawa eliminates another kaiju, and Ihiro becomes furious. 
He spent years training at a renowned technical college, so he can't understand why he isn't able to keep up with Ichikawa. Just then, they are told that more yoju have been spotted nearby, so the two of them head to the front lines. Ichikawa is shocked when he sees the jacket of the monster sweeping company, and he wonders what one of the cleaners is doing there. They try to explain that the cleaners won't be needed for a while, but they just get ignored. The mysterious person is just disappointed as the reproductive organs he loaded the yoju with have been destroyed. He wonders how they found out, and he speculates that somebody on the force knows all about kaiju. The guys are then shocked when this guy turns to them with his messed up face, and he wonders if they know anything about what happened. Thanks for watching my recap, subscribe to the channel to help us get to 700,000 subscribers.